magic realism has been criticised for its descent into cheap exoticism and even kitsch. See, for instance, British novelist Julian Barnes's tongue-in-cheek proposal that a quota system is to be introduced on fiction set in South America. The intention is to curb the spread of package tour baroque and heavy irony. Ah, the propinquity of cheap life and expensive principles, of religion and banditry, of surprising honour and random cruelty. It is then perhaps surprising to find that 100 years of solitude end so apocalyptically, with a mother bleeding to death, her newborn baby eaten by ants, and a hurricane of biblical proportions that destroys Macondo and its entire fictional universe, all of which is to be exiled from the memory of men. There is little here in the way of consolation or hope. The tone is closer to, say, the dirty realism of Charles Bukowski, James Elroy, or Cormac McCarthy, self-aware of the loneliness, societal atomization, and barbarism evident in its milieu, and marked by the monadic reality of containment, isolation, and distanciation, than to the gentle amiability that we may expect of the ever-smiling Garcia Marquez. Of course, in some ways, the book's concluding gesture is misleading. Macondo is, in fact, far from wiped out from its readers' memories. And despite the prediction that everything written in the manuscripts that describe and predict this holocaust, and so, by implication, everything that is written in the novel itself, was unrepeatable from time immemorial and forevermore, there have been innumerable attempts to copy and adapt the magical realist style, with more and less success, from Salman Rushdie to Laura Esquivel and beyond. Indeed, if anything tends to be forgotten about Garcia Marquez's novel, it is its devastating climax and the symbolic self-destruction of everything that has come before. This is the dark side of magical realism, its grotesque horror, that all too quickly fades from the reader's mind, or perhaps is simply not taken seriously enough in the first place. Within the novel, the various Buendias alternate between being open to and embracing everything that comes at them, or alternatively trying to shut themselves away from it. But in the end, the book is on the side of life, of a proliferating but inhuman multitude that even the savage denouement cannot overturn. Macondo may finally be wiped out thanks to the cataclysmic whirlwind that ends the novel, but signs of its decline are by then already long apparent. The book announces that it was the end, when Pilar Tenera dies. She is the last of the original characters, the last link to the town's utopian foundation. She had been part of the exodus that ended with the founding of Macondo. But people had been leaving, and the town emptying out, long before that. Even the birds that Amaranta Ursula, Jose Arcadio Buendia's great-great-granddaughter, introduces to repopulate the place, soon fly away. Despite periodic attempts at renovation and restoration, the town, the Buendia house, and the Buendia family have all been slowly falling apart and decaying into ruin for years. Where did it all go wrong? Perhaps the turning point are the rains unleashed by Mr. Brown of the Banana Company, they last four years, eleven months, and two days. And by the time the sky is finally clear, we're told that Macondo was in ruins. The wooden houses, the cool terraces for breezy, card-playing afternoons, seem to have been blown away in an anticipation of the prophetic wind that years later would wipe Macondo off the face of the earth. 
or maybe the beginning of the end, is the infamous massacre of striking banana workers and their families, shot down at the train station as they are swirling around in a gigantic whirlwind that little by little was being reduced to its epicenter as the edges were systematically being cut off all around like an onion being peeled by the insatiable and methodical shears of the machine guns. Perhaps everything starts to go downhill even earlier, with the arrival of the railway, which brings the North Americans, first to Mr. Herbert and then Mr. Brown, and leads to the initial establishment of the banana industry. The railway is charged with ambiguity and ambivalence, as it brings so many pleasant and unpleasant moments, so many changes, calamities, and feelings of nostalgia to Macondo. It seems to herald modernization, progress, and development, but the boom that it prompts is passing and brief, soon replaced by death and destruction, misery and decline. My question is whether all this is inevitable. Is Macondo doomed from the outset, as some of its inhabitants seem to think? More generally, what image of history does the book provide? Does history here have to mean deterioration and decay? Pause the video and have a think about time and historicity in the novel, writing some ideas in your notebook. While you do that, I'll have a shot of Aguardiente, but I'll be right back. The novel makes much of fate in all its various forms. Providence, destiny, premonition or misfortune. For the matriarch, Ursula, the Buendia family is perennially living under a curse and can at best only postpone the day when the child is born that is the tale of a pig. For Pilar Ternera, who divines the future through reading cards, but whose life is also intimately intertangled with that of the Buendias, although she is never formally part of the family or resident in the family home, she gives birth to children with both Colonel Aureliano Buendia and Jose Arcadio. A century of cards and experience had taught her that the history of the family was a machine with unavoidable repetitions, a turning wheel that would have gone on spilling into eternity were it not for the progressive and irredeemable wearing of the axle. There is something inherent to the family dynamic, therefore, that leads to both repetition and decline. Yet there are also hints that there might have been some way to trick fate, or to rid the family of its curse. Ursula hardly resigns herself to destiny, however much she believes in it. And even when she goes blind in her extreme old age, she finds ways to carry on and keep the rest of the family ignorant of her disability. Moreover, the same baby, whose tale ultimately fulfills Ursula's fearful premonition, may also, it seems, have had the capacity to renew the family, predisposed to begin the race again from the beginning, and cleanse it of its pernicious vices and solitary calling, for he was the only one in a century who had been engendered with love. His mother, Amaranta Ursula, suggests naming him Rodrigo, but his father refuses. We'll call him Aureliano, and he'll win thirty-two wars. It is only then that the midwife turns him over and they see the infant's ill-fated appendage. Might this have been avoided if they had given the child a different name? Or if other children earlier on 
had similarly been engendered with love. The novel's final lines tell us that races condemned to 100 years of solitude did not have a second opportunity on earth. But this too suggests that they had once had at least a first opportunity, even if they had blown it. For the town of Macondo, there are dangers as much as opportunities in being open to the wider world. There is often a sense that the place was happiest when it was isolated and cut off, when it had few visitors. It is true that those visitors that do find their way there, predominantly the gypsies, with their extravagant novelties brought from the ends of the earth, infuse the place of vitality, encouraging creativity and invention also among the villagers themselves. They inspire Jose Arcadio Buendia and his children to dream extravagantly of what lies beyond the horizon. Yet, heading elsewhere to seek fortune or fame seldom ends well. Colonel Aureliano Buendia's far-flung military adventures are ultimately a futile waste of time. A generation or two later, there are high hopes when young José Arcadio, son of Aureliano II, is sent to Rome his family convinced that he will one day become Pope. But he lives in misery and sordidness in a shared Trastevere garret until drawn back home in lieu of persisting with the endless fable of his pontifical vocation. His sister, Amaranta Ursula, does rather better in her own sojourn abroad, but is forever possessed by an image of Macondo idealized by nostalgia and ultimately returns to the town with her Belgian husband, never to leave again. But by then, it is too late. Once the town has found its place on the map, thanks to the telegraph, and above all the railway, it soon enters its long terminal decline after the brief banana boom. No wonder so many characters look back fondly to how things once were, when a trip to the capital was little less than impossible, and nobody had yet died in a small settlement closed in upon itself. By contrast, for the Buendia house and others within Macondo, for much of the time it tends to be a sign of health when it is open rather than closed. Closure is a form of death in life, or bare life at best. Rebecca, Jose Arcadio's wife, for instance, walls herself away. Upon her husband's death, she closed the doors of her house and buried herself alive, covered with a thick crust of disdain that no earthly temptation was ever able to break. Many years later, long forgotten by almost everyone. Her body is found, on her solitary bed, curled up like a shrimp, with her head bald from ringworm and her finger in her mouth. At times, other members of the Buendia family give in to a similar temptation to hide themselves away, and their house goes through extended periods with the doors and windows closed. Fernanda, Aureliano Segundo's wife, has the windows nailed shut with boards in the shape of a cross, in a collective penance imposed on all its inhabitants. These are almost always times of depression and decline. Periodically, however, someone will try to open the house up again. Amaranta Ursula, for example, being a happy modern woman without prejudices, with her feet on the ground, opened doors and windows in order to drive away the ruin, and tried in vain to reawaken the forgotten spirit of hospitality. As the wheel that is the family history turns, there is a constant tension between century, century petal and centrifugal forces. 
One of the last times that the house opens up is when young Jose Arcadio invites the local children to come and play. He would appear with them at siesta time and have them skip rope in the garden, sing on the porch, and do acrobatics on the furniture in the living room, until when into the, well into the night they could be heard chattering and singing and tap dancing, so that the house resembled a boarding school where there was no discipline. The kids turn Jose Arcadio himself into a plaything. Much as many years earlier, Amaranta Ursula and little Aureliano had treated the matriarch Ursula in her decrepitude as a big, broken-down doll that they carried back and forth from one corner to another, wrapped in coloured cloth, with her face painted with soot and anato. With Jose Arcadio, the children spend the morning shaving him, giving him massages with hot towels, cutting and polishing the nails on his hands and feet, and perfuming him with toilet water. Then they would dry him, powder his body, and dress him. It is as though order were finally being re-established through play. Then they stumble across the treasure that Ursula had long ago buried, which he had hoped to safeguard until its true owners came to collect it. That conception of reciprocity and debt has vanished, and the fortune is now available for immediate expenditure. With the money, therefore, Jose Arcadio turns the house into a decadent paradise, bringing in velvet curtains and packing the house with food and drink, such that the unused pantry was opened again for the storage of wines and liqueurs. The swimming pool is filled with champagne. But the games get out of hand. On finding that the children have torn down the curtains and broken the bathroom mirror, Jose Arcadio armed himself with an ecclesiastical cat and nine tails that he kept in the bottom of his trunk along with a hair shirt and other instruments of mortification and penance, and drove the children out of the house, howling like a madman. Some time later, however, the expelled children return, break in through the bathroom roof, and drown their former benefactor. Previous attempts to get into the bathroom from above had been inspired by erotic desire or love, a stranger dropping in on Jose Arcadio's aunt, Remedios the Beauty, or the clandestine trysts of his sister Meme with her lover Mauricio Babylonia, though their outcomes have been equally fatal. Now it is juvenile revenge that leads to Jose Arcadio's unceremonious end. What was once tragedy repeats as first. Openness can no longer save the house, nor can closure protect it. Meanwhile, the novel's final claim that it is a somehow unrepeatable event is both an impossible paradox and a self-fulfilling prophecy. For One Hundred Years of Solitude is indeed a singular book, and its astonishing combination of enormous critical and commercial success, has seldom, if ever, been duplicated. Not by any other of the novelists of the boom, nor even by Garcia Marquez himself. But it is precisely its uniqueness that has ensured that it has never lacked for imitators. No wonder that Barnes, or the writers later associated with the Mukondo movement, protesting against the sacred code of magic realism, should plead for a stop to the proliferating repetitions of something like, but not enough like, one hundred years of solitude, whose nadir was perhaps the war of Don Emmanuel's nether parts by self-proclaimed Marquez parasite Louis de Bernier. But more fundamentally, in that one hundred years of solitude, is also largely a book about, indeed, obsessed with, repetition. 
it goes against the novel's own logic that it should end with such an absolute prohibition of duplication and reiteration. After all, it is the failure of such a prohibition, the injunction against the Buendia family's original sin of incest, that sets its plot moving and drives it forward, as the narrative is full of every variation of incestuous desire, until finally the last of the line, Amaranta Ursula and her nephew, come together and produce the foretold offspring of the tail of a pig. However much you try to do things differently, and avoid the mistakes of the past, that past continues to haunt you. Indeed, it is perhaps because ultimately Macondo is so full of the ghosts of the motley cast of characters that have wandered through the book's pages, that Garcia Marquez can only put an end to it all by shouting, Enough! and bringing on a cataclysmic hurricane that tears the whole place down. For another irony is that this novel, whose title tells us it is, it is concerned with solitude, in fact, and thanks in part to its proliferating repetitions, presents us with what can only be called a multitude. Even at its conclusion, when Aureliano is practically the only man left in town, the very objects that surround him invoke the continued presence of other lives that live on through shared habits. He sits in a rocking chair, for instance, that is, the same one in which Rebecca had sat during the early days of the house to give embroidery lessons, and in which Amaranta had played Chinese checkers with Colonel Herineldo Marquez, and in which Amaranta Ursula had sewn the tiny clothing for the child. He feels oppressed under the crushing weight of so much past. This may well be a bad multitude. But the point is that his problem is hardly solitude per se, or at least not in any simple sense. More generally, this is a book that is characterized by excess and overindulgence more than anything else. Indeed, it would be no less misleading if it had the title One Hundred Years of Plenitude, or as critic Roberto González Echeverria puts it, by the end, the text has reduced us, like Aureliano, to a ground zero, where death and birth are joined as correlative moments of an incommunicable plenitude. It is so full that, like Jorge Luis Borges's Aleph, and for González Echeverria, Melquiades stands for Borges, which is infinite things in one small space, and contains the populous sea, dawn and dusk, the multitudes of the Americas. One hundred years of solitude threatens to make us mute, and has to be destroyed for anyone to write more, to crawl out from under its shadow. This is, after all, also a book that has ambition to be a total novel, another reason for it finally to declare that it can never be done again. And in service of that, itself, excessive ambition, it overflows. It is not just one multitude, but many. A multitude of Aurelianos and Jose Arcadios, of butterflies and beauties, of inventions and apparatuses, of firing squads and wars, of gypsies and bananas, of candy animals and goldfish, of flowers and books, of chamber pots and doubloons, of merchants and mistresses, of misinterpretations and mistakes, of solitudes, yes, solitudes too, and friendships. Everything is singular, but nothing is single. Another will, all, will always come along in time. If anything, Macondo's problem, and that of its inhabitants, is that it is never alone, that there is no way to avoid or prevent 
the manifold forces and energies that sweep through it. All these things have a life of their own, from the playful children to the ravenous red ants, overwhelm town, house, and family. Even closing doors and windows, shutting oneself away, is simply to embed oneself in the machine, often to invest still further in the formidable cycles of creation, production, and destruction that drive the multitude. The task, then, is less to resist the multitudes than to determine which are bad, pestilential, or merely kitsch, and which are good, which lead to death, and which enhance life in all its myriad incarnations.